everybody. This is Bob Goodwin, and welcome to another episode of Career Club Live. Thank you so much for joining. If you happen to be watching us on YouTube, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. It really does help. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by our newest service, Next Placement. If you're an HR professional and you're dealing with either layoffs or having to transition employees, we'd really encourage you to take a minute to learn more about Next Placement, where we're bringing a more people-centric, empathetic approach to helping folks who are caught up in career transition by bringing mental health services, emotional intelligence coaching, and deep community. We know that we're helping people move on to what's next, not just focusing on who's out. So with that, uh, I'm excited to introduce our guest today. It's Kevin McDonald, and Kevin is a VP People Services and Insights for the EW Scripps Company. If uh, you don't know that name off the top of your head, that's okay. Kevin's going to share some of the brands I know you are familiar with uh, that fall under the EW Scripps umbrella. Kevin's a frequent conference speaker and industry resource on HR transformation. Um, he's going to be sharing his expertise on managing through change. Uh, the, he's built the airplane in flight several times. Uh, also, we're going to talk about the role of analytics in HR, which I think is really a fascinating topic. And then lastly, a healthy dose of career advice. So with that, Kevin, welcome. Hey, Bob, how are you? I am doing fine, sir. It's uh, so good to see you. So uh, where do we find you today? From my home office in uh, Fairfield, Ohio, which is about 20 miles north of uh, Cincinnati. Awesome. Well, that kind of probably leads us to an easy thing is uh, uh, folks who have listened to our podcast before know I love to ask just a handful of questions to help people get to know you as a human being first, and then we'll kind of dive into all the worky stuff. So uh, Cincinnati, are you born and raised in Cincinnati or? Born and raised in Cincinnati. I uh, lived, uh, I think, in 10 places by the time I was 18. So I've lived <laughs> all over the city. My mom still manages apartments. And so that's we moved wherever she uh, was what was working at the time. So I've, awesome. I've lived all over the city. That's cool. So this is a loaded question for a Cincinnati person, but where did you go to school? So I graduated from Roger Bacon High School. So I'm a, a GCL kid. Awesome. And uh, for college? So I, I, I was a, a non-traditional student. I started working right after high school and uh, ended up getting uh, my, uh, ma uh, or I'm sorry, my bachelor's degree from uh, Thomas More. So awesome. Catholic school right across the river in Northern Kentucky. No, that's excellent. So for anybody who's not from Cincinnati, when you ask where somebody went to school in Cincinnati, that is code for where'd you go to high school? <laughs> so <laughs> college is a separate question. Absolutely. And then just a, a little bit, Kevin, about your family. Yeah, so uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife Sandra and I are going to cel be celebrating 25 years next March. Uh, so that is a long time to put up with me, Bob. I just, <laughs> so statehood certainly awaits her. Um, we have two uh, kids. Uh, my oldest, Cameron, is 23. And my youngest, my baby, is uh, just wrapping up her junior year of high school and she'll be a senior next year. Awesome. Well, you're way too young to have a 23 year old. Um, <laughs> and then um, just real quickly, do you mind uh, painting people just a little bit of a picture of your career and, and sort of maybe some key stops along the way? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, I started in the workforce right out of high school. Um, I started at uh, Fifth Third Bank, um, which is a uh, uh, was a much smaller bank at that time. That was in 1995, um, dating myself now. And uh it's, it's ballooned into a, a truly a super regional bank now. <clears throat> but when I was there, we were really Ohio and Florida and Indiana and a little bit of Kentucky. That was that was pretty small uh, relatively, uh, but started in, in the employee file room, really just lucked out. Didn't didn't know I was getting into HR, didn't try to get into HR, um, just kind of lucked out. And the entry level position that was open was in the employee file room. So literally started um entering, you know, new hires into the system and, you know, data entry and then actually mm -hmm. literally creating the employee file, like the actual file. Um, so wow. um, that's where I sat and that's what I did. And uh, after that, it was uh, just kind of opportunities knocked and I opened the door, um, you know, that that and which we'll, you know, know we'll get into later. Uh, but people always ask me, like, well, how did you get to, you know, various positions. It, that was it. Opportunities will knock and, and you have to be ready to answer even if you're terrified. So my, you know, my first job outside of the employee file room was dealing with retirement. So you have the 19 year old at that point, you know, dealing with 401k and pension. I, I you know, 
I hadn't even been born yet, and I'm dealing with retirement stuff mm -hmm. uh, from from a career standpoint. But uh, spent a lot of time in the benefits department, um, doing a lot of things. Um, actually, transitioned for about a year over to our corporate tax department um, because that's where the equity compensation program. Mm -hmm was managed. Um, our, our SVP of corporate tax at that time uh, owned that. Um, realized that uh, it was great experience, but I am not an accountant and I do not like taxes. So <laughs> I was like, okay, it's time to get back into HR. So I uh, got back into HR operations and did a lot of outsourcing, uh, just a lot of project work and uh, spent 11 years, a little over 11 years at Fifth Third before I uh, joined Scripps in 2007 and uh, have been here since uh and uh so going on just, just a, just a couple quick things just on your background i love the non-traditional mm -hmm. right so you, you joined the workforce right out of high school without uh having college yet which um you know i for me personally is really interesting to hear because you know there's so much talent out there that doesn't have a four-year degree and so that's cool second thing that you said was um you, you know, you, you just sort of kind of air quote fell into it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And as young people, like we don't always know what we want. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just need to try stuff. It's like kids with band instruments or sports. Like you just need to try stuff. Right. Which, like you tried accounting, not so much went back to HR because you knew that you liked that. Mm -hmm. And then last thing that you said that, that sort of strikes me is that just the opening the door when opportunity knocks and not being afraid to take a chance. And can I really do this? I don't know. I guess we'll find out, mm -hmm. but I, but you've got to open those doors. And I think it's also a credit to you that those doors are being knocked on. So clearly you're doing good work. When um, when you're not at work, uh, what do we find you doing? Ooh, uh, I, I, I don't have the ability to say no easily to people. So the answer to that is a lot. So uh, I am uh, in my 12th year now coaching uh, high school basketball at Fairfield. Uh, it started way back when my oldest daughter was uh, was playing in middle school and I just stuck with it and and, and continued to coach. Um, so yeah, entering my twelfth year this year um, with with that. Uh, my youngest daughter is a uh, cheerleader and has been for for years. So I'm you know cheer dad, but also she's in uh, uh, Fairfield Show Choir programs, which are uh, quite honestly known throughout the country for um, how successful they are. And I'm one of the tech dads, um, which basically means I'm a roadie. <laughs> um, we, we get to move all their stuff and set it up and break it down in between shows and all, all that fun stuff. And she loves it. And it, it's it's um, it, it's really great to be able to be be involved with something that that she uh, loves and cherishes the way she does. Um, I'm also with uh, Tower House on their fatherhood committee. I've um, mm -hmm. been doing that for a few years now, which is um, a, a really great program um, about helping fathers reestablish themselves in their kids lives. Um, and providing resources to do that. Uh, my, <clears throat> you know, my father, my biological father left when I was but a baby. So I, I grew up without a, you know, a true father. And so that that program is really near and dear to me. Um, and then uh, I would say last thing, I'm on the board of a, a nonprofit um, based here in Fairfield called the Purple Monkey Project. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to purplemonkeyproject.org and find out more information. Um, but um, it's, it's, uh, it was started um, due to the loss of a a friend of ours, um, their 10 year old daughter, Reagan. And, um, she was, a, a a serial spreader of joy in the community. And, and it was really started to, um, you know, continue on that legacy of spreading joy. And, and so we provide scholarships and awards and pay off school fees and just do, uh, different things, kind of acts of kindness in her name throughout the community. So, um, you know, very involved with that. And, I'm sure there's other stuff I'm forgetting, but that's probably enough. <laughs> well, well, I tell you what, I mean, that's that's why we like asking these questions, because I just learned some stuff about you I didn't know prior to this conversation. So, you know, you definitely seem to be someone who runs to meet a need and, and see something that needs to be done and just rolls up your sleeves and gets involved. So that's awesome. You know, um, it's, interesting. It, it's interesting, Bob. I, I, I had a, a, a former coach um, uh, who was the head coach that, that I worked with for years and years and years. And, and he, he once called me a gap filler. Um, mm -hmm. It just, you see a gap and you fill it. And, and it's so interesting. And I know we'll get into this, but just as it relates to kind of career, career work, you know, 
what are you doing to fill gaps and make yourself valuable? But that's, we'll get into that. Yeah, well, yeah, you're right. Well, we might as well just touch on something super quick. So that's one of the things that we talk about at Career Club is, you know, what is your unique value proposition? What are the problems that you solve or the opportunities you help the company take advantage of? And if you don't know what that is, are you really filling gaps? Yeah. So I think that that's a, that's a great way of, exp- I'm going to start expressing it that way to clients. <laughs> I really like that gap filler. Um, so for folks who are not familiar with EW scripts, can you just maybe describe some of the brands and then the double click on that is and what your role is it just a little bit more in detail? Yeah, absolutely. Um, EW scripts is a, it, it's a really fantastic company with a, just an unbelievable history um, started back in the 1870s with the, the penny press, which was really the, the first newspaper that was designed for uh, the working class. Um, mm-hmm. And it was uh, based in Cleveland. Um, and, you know, fast forward all these years later um, through uh, so much change. I mean, in my 16 years, there's been really three transformational transactions that we've done um, uh, just in my 16 years as a company. And so, uh, you know, it's been a great opportunity for me to, to participate in that and to learn and to, you know, flex, you know, different muscles that, you know, that it takes to go through those things. Um, but from a company standpoint, it's been really interesting to watch um, our company leadership, you know, that's changed over time, of course, um, continually look at kind of what's, where do we need to go next? Um, you know, as, <clears throat> as news and information is, consumed by, you know, obviously various people and now hundreds of different ways um, versus, you know, what it was even 20 years ago. So we own, we're based here in Cincinnati. We own local TV stations throughout the country. Um, We're in 60 plus TV stations and 30 plus markets now. Um, We own some national networks as well, like ION. Um, Most people would know us um, and actually uh, coming up uh, uh, is the uh, Scripps National Spelling Bee. Yes. Uh, so that's that's a that's a Scripps property as well. Um, so we you know we exited the newspaper business in 2015, um, but prior to that, so when I first got here, we were um, still big in the newspaper business. Um, we've been in the radio business in the past um, and, and exited that as well. So now it's really uh, TV and uh, you know both local and national networks uh, in, in the spelling bee, and then also uh, the Scripps Howard Foundation as well, uh, which is kind of our philanthropic arm. Okay. And so, and then your role as a VP of people services and insights. Yeah. So, you know, every few years, if you've been around the HR space, we, you know, we, we come up with new fancy names for things we do. Most people would think of what I do as, as HR operations. Um, so it's, it's HR technology. So we're a, we're a workday shop, both on the HR and financial side. So the team that administers workday reports up through me. So HR and financials um, technology, um, I have what you would truly consider kind of back office, um, HR compliance. So HR, uh, uh, payroll, you know, payroll tax, uh, dealing with, you know, all the different union stuff that we deal with as well and processing payments and all the withholdings. So all of that stuff, we try to kind of, we, years ago when we did our HR transformation project, we wanted to pull as much administration out of the field as possible and centralize that or source it. And, and, and we've done that. So we also manage the relationship with uh, companies that we outsource uh, various services to. And then the last part of what reports to me is uh, the insights portion. And so uh, I have a, a director of uh, HR insights who, you know, I was really tasked them with two things. Tell us something about our people that we don't already know, and we need to start measuring the effective effectiveness of HR programs. Um, just uh, recently, um, I've added a member to the team as well that's um, our director of employee experience. And so that's another, just another, uh, a lot of employee listening, um, which is more insights into the organization as well. And he and mm-hmm. um, the, my insights guy uh, work very closely together on that. So that's, so, that's kind of what makes up my group. So HR operations and, and insights, I'm really interested in both. When we've spoken before, Kevin, and you just alluded to it a minute ago, like the company continues to go through transformations, making acquisitions, exiting businesses. I mean, that is a lot. And of course, people are coming in and out yes. uh, of the company. You've got integrations, you've got divestitures, right? And trying to keep up with all that stuff at a high level. If, if somebody's listening to this and maybe specifically in, if they're in HR 
operations or, or more broadly, you know, have oversight over HR issues. And then maybe even more generally with kind of change management, mm -hmm. what are some guiding principles for you that like keep the wheels on the bus so this thing doesn't crash while we're trying to, to get it to the next place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, change doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, it, it's changed in the organization and it really has to be managed by, you know, not just HR, not just, you know, corporate communications, not just leadership. It, it really takes, uh, you know, a, a lot of people coming together to, to pull right. through that. Um, you know, I, I think a couple of things that have made us successful here at Scripps um, and, and me personally successful with all of the, uh, you know, transactions that we've done is establishing relationships outside of my group um, and not, mm -hmm. not working in a vacuum. So I, I work uh, very closely with our IT group. I work very closely with our finance and accounting group to make sure that anything that we're doing um, doesn't adversely impact them and vice versa. Uh, and that, that we always kind of go in lockstep with, um, you know, everything we're doing, you know, our systems and our processes and people, they're, they're so intertwined. You, you can't, um, it, you could very easily uh, unravel something uh, unintentionally if you're not on the same page. So I would say that that to me it has been a guiding principle of mine you know, from the beginning is you have to establish those relationships and work together well uh, with, with people, you know, in terms of, you know, change management, I, I think the, the first thing, and, and I, you know, I subscribe to a, a, a fairly simple version of change management. Um, and, and I won't steal this. It came from a, a gentleman named Chris McGough. Um, but it's really about just gaining agreements on, on some critical elements, like what's at stake? Why are we doing this? And sometimes there's a transactional element to it that's mm -hmm. triggering something like, oh, well, we bought this entity. So therefore, you know, we have to do that. It's going to close on this date and, you know, whatever. So th those things make sense. And then sometimes there are just things that we as a company feel that we need to do this to remain competitive or take advantage of an opportunity or whatever that may be. But like, what's at stake? Why are we doing this? And understand, under, truly understanding where you are now and where you are going to be or where you need to be and getting the agreement on what that looks like, kind of the path to get there from, from one point to the other. Um, and, and making sure that, again, that core group of folks that really need to work together, understand all that and agree you know, on, on those things, I think is uh, super critical. And uh, I can tell you, it's been, we've been very successful with it. We, we've been through some our transactions aren't just transactions in and of themselves. I'll give you, for example, when I first came to Scripps, we were working through our HR transformation, what we called our HR remodel. We owned HGTV at the time, so it was kind of a play on that. Um, and uh, as we were working through the HR remodel, which was a multi-year project, um, we decided to split the company. So we, you know, it, things like that. When we were deploying Workday, which was, you know, a, with HR financials and everything we went live with, which is about an 18 month project. By the time we got everything live, we were acquiring three companies or three different um, uh, companies at the same time um, over that period of time. Wow. So when you're going through not only just the initial change, but kind of the other changes that are happening around you that impact you, you better stay on the same page with, um, you know, with, with that core group. So quick question. Um, you know, first thing you said was relationships. And then second thing I heard you say was kind of gaining agreement on yeah. you know, we're here and we need to get to there. How do you manage disagreement? So if I'm going to throw finance under the bus for yeah. a second, but you know, finance is like, no, this is too expensive. No, you got to do this cheaper. Like we can't afford this, whatever the objection might be. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, but to do this right, it costs so much money or this is going to be highly disruptive mm -hmm. to people and yeah. finance is like, well, people's interesting, but I care about profit. But like, how do you manage conflict? Yeah, I, I so it, it's so interesting. So fast forward from the HR transformation, um, uh, which was 2000, between 2007 and 2009. And, you know, when, when I first arrived at Scripps and then um, around 2013 or, or 14, um, we, we started a finance and accounting transformation in the company, which very same principles that we were trying to do HR, trying to pull administration out of the field and really focus on value added work in the field. Um, and I was asked to help with with that project, even though I, I have no finance and accounting background. Uh, but I said, sure. And the first thing um, that, that I looked for. So at the time we had outsourced a, a, a significant amount of back office accounting work as well. 
and that also wasn't going so well. Um, and so the first thing that I looked at was, why are we doing this? Why did we say we were doing this? And it was, hey, we, are gonna, we were going to transform the way we did things. Well, we didn't transform the way we were doing things. Therefore, it wasn't working very, you know, that mm -hmm. portion of the project wasn't working out very well. So I met with our CFO at, at the time and our controller, and, I, and we just established a, a few guiding principles. And, and that, that's where you have to start. Why are we doing this? Forget the ROI, just why are we doing it? Why do we think this is a good idea? Because if we don't get agreement on that, mm -hmm. then you're going to fight about every little decision. Um, kind of a funny story that I tell out of that project is, <clears throat> so I asked, I, I asked our CFO at the time, and this was just beautiful. Um, he, I said, why are we doing this? Like, what, what's your vision? And he said, accounting transactions should be done by accountants and financial analysis should be done by finance professionals. And I'm like, that sounds simple enough. Wrote that down. That becomes guiding principle number one. Mm -hmm. So fast forward, you know, months down the road as we're having conversations about, hey, we're going to change this. We're going to change this. And we got agreement from leadership on that statement. Every time somebody would say, well, no, I think Bob should continue to do. No, no, no. Accounting transactions will be done by accountants. We all agreed to this. And to the point where, I mean, we got more mileage out of that one sentence than I can get just about anything, but to the point where he actually came back to me at one point and he said, I feel like we tricked people. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, since they agreed to this, they can't disagree on these smaller decisions down the road. And I said, I, said, I don't think we tricked people. We're just constantly pointing back to our North Star because you're going to get lost in the weeds. You're going to get lost in the woods of all the minutia that needs to be decided on. And if you don't have that North Star to look at, you're going to get lost. And all of a sudden, a 10-month project becomes a 25-month project and mild, mildly, if successful at all, if you don't always go back to what your guiding principles were. So for me, if you don't start there, you're kind of asking for trouble. No, it's cool because, I mean, again, zooming out a little bit, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, mission and vision kind of work, mm -hmm. right? It's like Absolutely. Work and values. It's like, well, if you don't know those things, then you do get really lost very quickly mm -hmm. in the minutia because you, you don't have something that's leading you in a certain yeah. direction. I think that's awesome. Well, one of the things that we had talked about in, in earlier conversations um, is, and you even kind of just mentioned this a minute ago, like when projects aren't going the way they're supposed to go or something's happening. Do you mind sharing the principle that you shared with me from the book Range about firefighters and their tools? Oh, yeah. So just that, that and that one really jumped out at me when I read this book. I highly recommend the book range um, to, to your listeners as well. Um, but basically, the, it's the principle of dropping your tools. And um, so the, the kind of the real world application of this in, in the book um, is, is a very sad one. But um, it's about firefighters that get dropped into forest fires. And literally, they get dropped into the middle and there's fire all around them um, and, and they uh, do their thing. Each one has a specialty, whether it's a chainsaw, whether it's not, like they have some kind of special tool that they carry. And occasionally there will be a call out on the radio that says, drop your tools and run. Like the winds have shifted or something's happened. Um, the fire's coming at you. And um, the ones that drop their tools and run, they, they you know, survive and some do not survive. And they, they said they routinely find them holding on their tools. And, you know, when you're carrying a 50 pound chainsaw or something that slows you down. So, um, you know, the analogy that it was making kind of to the business world is we all come to projects, to, you know, initiatives, whatever it is to work every day. We all come with our tools and our tools are the things that we have found to be successful in the past. But so you've got to be willing to drop your tools to find a, a, a better tool or a better way um, to, to get out of a situation. And I, I just I, I love the analogy because um, I think it's really important on, on all of us to, to remain humble. Um, even though this may have been successful in the past, every situation is kind of unique. Um, e even even acquisitions. I mean, in my time here at Scripps, we're, we're, we've done thirty plus you know transactions, and while I approach them all from a high level with the same idea, everyone is unique. Everyone's going to have unique challenges, and, and you got to be willing to drop your tools to an extent and say, okay, wh what do we need to be successful with this one? Yeah, it's funny. Even with Career Club as an entrepreneur. Um, you know, the, the principle of you know, one, helping people find a career that matters to them and kind of underlying that is using sales and marketing principles to help people do that. The form that that has taken 
and the underlying technologies we continues to evolve based on you know where we're seeing people have the most success so i might have it in my head that this is the right way to do it well it might be the right way for me to do it but what i learned is like my clients aren't me and i need to design and not just be so fixated on only one way to do something but you know being open to are there other ways of doing that to your earlier point allow us to accomplish what we set out to do right so that didn't change the mission didn't change right how we accomplish the mission I, I'm very open to, I'm agnostic mm -hmm. on that. Like, I just care about what works mm -hmm. and, you know, it helps people. And in the same way, you, you want to see your project done on time, achieving its business objective that was originally mm -hmm. stated. So I think that's cool. Um, one of the other areas, Kevin, that I think is so fascinating about what you're doing is in this area of analytics. And you talked about, you know, is, are these HR things that we're doing, are they actually working and how would we know? Mm -hmm. um, so do you mind just sort of casting a little bit more about your vision for analytics and then how it's being deployed there at Scripps? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, and I've been in HR for 25 plus years now. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we do because we have to do it, right? We, we It's a company based in the United States of America. There's rules and regulations and we have to pay taxes. We have to, there's just certain things you have to do to remain compliant, right? You have to do government reporting, et cetera. And that's all stuff that, you know, you want to do that in the most efficient, effective, let's be honest, cheap <laughs> way that you can possibly do it and meet the, you know, whatever that, that requirement is. Um, and I've spent, you know, a good portion of my career focused on things like that. Right. Um, and so you're always looking for, you know, uh, is there a cheaper way? Is there a faster way, a better way, more efficient, whatever? Um, because what you want is you want your employees, you, you want your people. In my case, I want my people focused on more strategic things. I want them focused on things that are actually going to drive our business forward or help people that are trying to drive our business forward, like help, you know, help them help our business. Right. And so as we look at HR programs like talent management, leadership development, um, you know, learning and, and, and education, um, you, even talent acquisition to, to an extent, um, even though there's a lot of compliance uh, related stuff in talent acquisition. What can we do? What data can we provide to show that what these programs are doing are actually driving the business forward and actually having a business impact? Um, you know, if you look at training, you know, and, and every industry is going to be different on this, but a good portion of the training that, that any company does is just compliance. Mm. We got to do the handbook training once a year, you know, for, for people in, um, you know, industries where you have to be certified to do certain things. And maybe that comes up one or every one or two years, you have to do training in order to do that. So a lot of the training that we do is just compliance related it's stuff that we have to do. And then there's this whole other set of training that's done to, better enable salespeople to, to, you know, to do their job better or, you know, whatever that is. And how can we measure that to show that that's actually having an impact and we don't need to pivot? You know, every year these, these you know, these folks go to leadership during budget season. And I, I, I used to tell our uh, uh, talent acquisition person all the time, I feel horrible for you sitting in front of leadership every year with a budget because you're like, look, we've got this many roles to fill and you know, I've got this much cost in order to do it. And, you know, she's getting pelted with questions. I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually show, hey, look, the quality of hire for the people that my internal team is bringing in is here, right? Help help me help you tell that story mm -hmm. so that you don't get pelted with questions every, every budget season. And basically, you know, fight, it felt like she was fighting for, you know, survival every budget season. Um, and, and there's other areas like that around talent management, you know. I don't want to do these things just because everyone else is doing them. I don't want to do these things just because, you know, in some cases it's table stakes. Like, well, if we don't have a talent program, then, you know, people are going to leave for companies that do. Well, that's great. And that may be true. But can we actually show that people that go through whatever these programs were designing, that they're more productive, that they're more engaged, that they stay longer, whatever it is. Right. And so that measurement of the, uh, the effectiveness of HR programs is, is a real passion of mine and, and something that we've, you know, we're, we're stepping into it and we're trying to figure out what the, the, the right thing is. And, you know, 
as we're changing as a company too. So that every time you have big change, it can kind of reset some things as well, which is fair. And, and, and we have to work through that. You know, the other side of that too is, you know, again, telling people, uh, telling our leadership something about our people that they don't know. I, I, yes, I know we have 5,600 employees. Thanks, Kevin, for that, right? Um, I, I know that roughly they're distributed, you know, this way across the country and so many are in, you know, this role versus that role. That's great information just to have, a, it'll come in handy every now and then. But tell me something about our people that I don't know. Where's our highest turnover? Is it people that have just joined? Is it people that have been here between five and six years? Tell me about turnover for people that um, have experienced a, you know, a mobility event, whether that was a promotion or a move to another market. You know, does that, uh, does that increase or decrease their turnover? Um, Tell me, you know, as we did with uh, one recent executive, um, tell me about the um, uh, turnover for a, a particular role based on where they are in the salary range. Where, where's that sweet spot of the salary range where turnover actually is dropping versus maybe it's a little higher here or lower? Like is because it's it, Bob, it's so funny, you know, things that seem intuitive. Well, if you don't pay them, they're they're leaving. Well, Maybe that's true, but that's not true in all cases, yeah. right? And so, you know, you, you have to let the data kind of guide where you go. Uh, you can go in with a, with a hypothesis. You can go in with an assumption. But again, I, I keep going back to that word, like, be humble. Let, let the data take you to the next step and, and be willing to say, you know what? Even though, you know, I've been in HR for 25 years and that seems intuitive, it's actually not the case here. And why isn't that the case? Now let's go find out why that's not the case, right? Um, so it, it's those kinds of things that really excite me about um, insights and and um, what the information that we can provide to the company, because it's not just about, you know, and I think it was you that, that had the phrase, it's not just what it is, why does that matter? And what should we do about it? That's what, so HR. what, and now what? Thank you, yes. Yes. Yeah. No. That, that that's it. And so the 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 bigger issue here for for our HR friends who might be listening to this is you know the um, ever present quest for the seat at a ta seat at the table, right? And and I think that what you're doing, Kevin, it's one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on. Is this is this is the prescription? Tell me something I don't already know about the business. What should I do about it? Show me the impact of these programs that are having the language of business is numbers. Yeah, it is. You know, and so did it make us money? Did it save us money? Did it mitigate some kind of a risk? Those are sort of the three main value buckets that something's going to fall into an initiative would fall into. You use the example of salespeople. That's an easy one, right? They sold more stuff. That, that's that's pretty simple. But you know, when you look at like some of the retention numbers that you're talking about or engagement numbers, productivity numbers, and hey, we did this and it had this impact. You know, guess what? It's going to be a whole lot easier for the talent lady to get funding for something when she's got data behind her to say, well, it's just not because it feels good or it's the right thing to do or, you know, this is the latest thing that I read about, you know, that we should be doing too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's the data that just supports it. And like you say, let the data guide you. And, and I think that it would be truly transformational for more, more HR executives to be guided by data, to be armed with data and uh, to really be speaking, you know, the language of business. Cause we talk about people are most important assets and all that kind of stuff, right. but it's really kind of taking that analytical lens into it to be able to provide back to leadership, you know, exactly what you said again, like, tell me something I don't know, or I have a hypothesis. Can you help me suss this out? Right. You know, so, and, and then lastly, for, for people that didn't quite catch it, it's what, so what, and now what? Because we could say, hey, you know, 25% uh, of our turnover is coming from this uh, employee band or the salary band or length of tenure, functional, whatever it is, Okay, so what? Like, should I care about that? Right. Is this important? Is it affecting the business in some way or the other? Well, actually, yeah, because it's preventing us from doing something that's very measurable. Great. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, 
what should I do about it? Yeah. And I think this is the little bit, you know, on, on the one side, you talk about humility. I think another piece of this is courage mm-hmm. and having the courage yeah. to, to stand up and say, this, is, I'm going to take a stand on something. Mm-hmm. I believe based on the data, this is what we should do. And not everybody's got that personality type, but that's the beauty of data is you've got a very firm foundation to stand on mm-hmm. rather than it feels like, it seems like, it's like, no, it is. And yeah. Well, it's, it, it's interesting. I, I, two, two things to that. One, so in addition to some of the things that, some of the tools that we've created and dashboards we've created, we created one that um, calculates the cost of turnover. And, and the great thing about it, because you ask any consultant, what's the cost of turnover? I guarantee you'll hear anything from 25% to like 150%. And I'm like, okay, so nobody, we're never going to agree on what that number is. But what we did with our dashboard is they can, the executive that's using it can plug in any number they want. If you, if you only want to give me 10%, fine, 10%, plug in 10% and it'll tell you what the cost of turnover is. And what people don't understand is, um, even at a company like Scripps, which doesn't, which doesn't have our turnover is not crazy high by any stretch. Um, but when you're talking about certain roles, you know, it, it can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars a year. And as the cost of turnover, just giving me 25 percent, which is the minimum, what you is what you would hear from pretty much any consultant. Um, so that's that's the so what. Right. That, OK, so turnover is X. So what? Well, so what? It's costing you five hundred thousand dollars a year to, to fill just that one role. The, the, the now what, um, an interesting story. So I have a, a, a friend and, and somebody that we uh, still uh, do business with. He, he owns an analytics uh, uh, consultancy in, in Austin. And uh, one of the great stories that, that he tells, and I'm gonna, I know he wouldn't mind me uh, stealing it, is he, he was doing work with the hospital. And um, uh, they were talking about nurses and uh, the, the cost of turnover and what they should do. <clears throat> and his, he actually showed them through analysis that they would be better off having three, three nurses sit on the bench and do nothing and pay them than you would be waiting for somebody to leave trying to fill it because the overtime cost that you pay while you're trying to fill those roles. <laughs> and he knew how long it took to fill over time because you have that data. He actually showed you that you'd be better off with three just sitting at home waiting for you to call saying, hey, I need you now financially. And so, yeah. again, something that you would never think is true, but in this case, financially, it's true because, again, that was a, a high turnover position and they were, you know, it took, you know, in their case, six to eight weeks to fill a uh, minimum. That's six to eight weeks of overtime that I'm paying um, people to fill that role, you know, yeah. while we wait. So, yeah, the, the data to me is um, and that model that you laid out is so critical, you know, from an HR standpoint to be able to, uh, yeah, we're people and people are, you know, a little squishy in terms of it's not just a number, but there are things that we can point to that, that show the value of, you know, data and, and data literacy and, and storytelling from a people perspective. Well, actually, th- that's a perfect segue into, I, I alluded to uh, in your introduction that you speak at conferences, you were recently yeah. at Unleash. Yeah. Um, and what was the topic there and, and what were you sharing and then we'll kind of just dig into that some yeah so uh the the session the panel that i was was on with um uh two wonderful hr leaders from uh different industries different different parts of the country um was basically uh what should future hr leaders know about themselves and it was kind of uh the the idea behind it was what other kind of skill sets beyond just your you know, HR knowledge that you have in a in a vacuum, like what other um, skills should, should you consider important as you grow your career in HR? OK, and and so what, what would be the top three things that, that you were suggesting? Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I think, you know, again, given where we are, we're in 2023, but we still feels like in some cases we're coming out of the, the pandemic. And, um, you know, one of the questions that that the moderator asked us all to, to consider was what coming out of the pandemic, what what were some things that you either learned about yourself or do you feel like your organizations relied on HR for maybe that they, they wouldn't have, uh, which I thought was an interesting take on things. Um, but some things came up like empathy and you know, where, you know, we need to be kind of the voice of the voice of the employee. Um, it's, you know, it's these things were not just business decisions, you know, people's lives were at stake, literally um, and figuratively. Um, but but in terms of 
you know, my kind of general answer to the question um, for me, project management. I think you you have to have some project management discipline and fundamentals, um, and that's what's going to allow you um, not only to, to succeed in HR because a lot of what we do is uh, relying on that, but it's going to your own personal credibility. It's going to allow the organization to come to you in the case of like me and say, "Hey, Kevin, this project in you know finance and accounting isn't going. Can, can you help out there?" It's like, well, sure. Because again, I don't have to know anything about finance and accounting to know why that project wasn't going yeah. well. I didn't know about journal entries or anything like that, right? It was it was all things that were kind of project and program management fundamentals. I think the other thing um, th that I would throw out there is root cause analysis. Um, you know, I, one of my favorite quotes, um, and I, I'm a big quote guy, um, and, I, and I love them, but uh, one of my favorite quotes is, a, a problem well stated is half solved. And what, what I found in my career is that a lot of people that come to you with a problem and they'll say, I need help with this. They're not actually what they stated was the problem isn't actually the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. Mm. And so your ability to really dig down and figure out what is the actual root cause that I can help you solve. And then the symptoms will take care of themselves. Yep. Right. But, you know, just getting people to kind of weed through and, and in some cases, um, in some cases it's a lot and, and, and people come to you with a lot of baggage cause they've been carrying it for years. And so they feel it. And so, you know, not minimizing it, but saying, Hey, I understand, but that's, let's, let's get down to what the root is. Um, so I think root cause analysis, which, you know, I kind of throw under, under project management as well, um, is really important. And then the, the last thing for me was kind of what I said earlier is you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, you know, I'll never forget a, a mentor of mine um, who, who's now our, our CEO, COO here, um, you know, told me a long time ago, Kevin, you're going to you're going to get invited to sit down in rooms with and you're going to walk in like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> like, I have no business in this room. And she said, you know, some people in the room may look at you like, what the hell is he doing here? Like, what what do, what do you have to offer? And, you know, you have to be comfortable enough in your own skin that you were invited here because you have something to offer. And if yeah. people have a problem with that, then that's on them. Right. You, you were asked here to, to do something. And, um, you know, that always stuck with me. And it doesn't mean you, you jump in and try to take over right away. It just means I'm here for a reason. There's something I have to offer. And, and, I, and I'm going to offer that as, as the time presents itself or so the opportunity presents itself, um, even if it's, again, a topic that I just have you know, no idea. I mean, I was, there was another opportunity where it was around sales compensation and I'm like, I don't know anything about sales compensation. I've never even been a salesperson. Right. But again, that wasn't the issue. The issues were things that, that we could solve. And so, um, you know, I, I think those things are, uh, the, the three that I would point can, to. Can, can I break that down a little bit? Cause you know, as you were talking, I sort of was feeling a little bit of a sequence there. Yeah. So I'm not married to my sequence, but, but I think, I think you really, highlighted some really interesting things. One was um, a problem well stated is half solved. It may be more uh, uh, reflection of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So so kind of first thing is like, well, where's some, what's going on in the business? Mm -hmm. And then the next bit was around data literacy. Well, I don't know. Let's see what the data tells us, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I could be in that meeting that you're talking about and someone could have a very loud voice. Yes literally and figuratively, they could have a title that allows them to command the attention of the room. They just may not be right. Whatever they're saying may just be, that's the way it used to be there. You know, that, that was at their last company, that's what it was. So they're just going to project. That's what it is here, but let the data guide you. Um, then the next bit is, well, based on what the data is telling us, that allows me now to organize a project. Yes. To go solve. Well, one, the, the data will help me get to the root cause of what the thing is, which is your root cause analysis, which mm -hmm. then allow informs. Well, then what's the project that goes and tackles that root, right? And then because you're solving real business problems that are measurable, mm -hmm. how do we know they're measurable? Because they're grounded in data. We we already figured we already know mm -hmm. that, right? So you know, we when you are getting these promotions, for me. It's because you're somebody that gets stuff done, right? You, you <laughs> can point to things that, you know, and I could say that slightly less uh, elegantly, but 
the people yes. get promoted are people that get stuff done. Yes. Right. Because there's more always more stuff to be done. And we, we need people that know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I would go back to symptoms. Let's look at the data that will tell us what the root cause of this thing is. Organize a project, execute the project right. with excellence. And then you, you probably have the future in HR you're looking for. Well, and, and, and it's it's interesting you, you say that because we, you know, GSD, it's kind of what I tell my my group and you can figure out what that stands for. Um, but that, that's what we do. And, and you have to do that with excellence. You know, I, I mean, payroll is a perfect example. I told the group in, uh, at Unleash, I said, you know, HR professionals, you, you can't run away from the stuff that you just have to get done because that's uh, when you talk about payroll and benefits, those are the bottom of the employer hierarchy of needs, right? I mean, those are the base. No, it, people can believe in your mission as an employer uh, and as employees, but nobody's volunteering. They're they're doing this to support their family, and you know benefits are a, a portion of that as well. A lot of people work literally just to have the health care, yes. um, and so you know we have to realize that, and we have to make sure that that stuff is done with excellence. Because I guarantee you, I I, I have I tell people all the time. I said I'm a magician. I can actually make every single one of your employees forget about every HR initiative right now screw up the next payroll <laughs> i guarantee they will forget about all your talent initiatives and all they'll forget all about that all they're worried about is where's my money because i need that in order to live and so you know we have to take those things seriously as well um and, and not run away from that because yeah. that's the stuff that's going to build credibility for you personally over time is continually getting that stuff done um with excellence to to your point so no i i think that's a really critical um, element as well. Super helpful. So last thing, um, because I, I love talking about talent, mm -hmm. you know, this is career club, not job search club and, and careers take time. One of the things that, that you were sharing with me in a previous conversation was uh, kind of your take on generalists versus specialists. I so yeah. if you could just maybe unpack that for a minute. Yeah. So, um, you know, th this really hit me, um, more from a coaching perspective um, that it, but it, it applies professionally as well. But I see it a lot um, with, with, uh, with kids, um, not only because I have a lot of friends with young kids and they're all doing something, soccer, basketball, you know, baseball, football, what, whatever it is. And parents are spending an extraordinary amount of money these days on these yes. things. I mean, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think it really is uh, uh, important for me, and I found it successful um, that, you know, I would consider myself very much a generalist. I've tried a lot of different things and I've honed skills over time, right? That um, I, I took a little bit from here and a little bit from there and a little bit from there. And it's all kind of come together to doing what I do now and certainly, you know, managing a function that has, you know, multiple, you know, tentacles for, for different things that we do for the organization um, requires that. And, and I think it really um, starts to highlight your abilities as, as just as a leader, right? It, and, and I, you know, years ago when I was, you know, early on in my career and, you know, look, I, I had two older brothers that, you know, are among the, just the smartest people I know, just full stop. Um, and so I valued competence more than almost anything, right? And what I've learned over time is competence will get you so far and competence in a silo will get you real far. But if you're looking to have a, an impact, you know, across the, truly across an organization, it takes a lot more than competence. Um, and I think that's the stuff where, you know, allow yourself and parents, allow your kids um, to experience a lot of different things, um, including failure. It's okay. That, that's some of the best lessons that, that you know, uh, Master Yoda said it, uh, the, the failure a, a great teacher is or something. I can't remember exactly how he phrased it, but like, it's okay. It, it's okay if you weren't successful. What, what can I learn from that yeah. um, and, and take that away? So. But when you're interviewing people, and we'll start winding this down here a sec, yeah. when you're interviewing people uh, and or building your team, what are the some of the traits, the qualities that, that people have that really resonate with you? What are you looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the big things I'm looking for is just adaptability. Um, I, I, you know, I, I know what job you're hi being hired to do, right? And, and I can read the job description. Um, 
but I think it's much easier to teach somebody how to do a particular job or, you know, administer a particular system or manage a particular process, what, whatever it is they're trying to do. Um, it, it's, it's much more difficult to um, get somebody that, you know, that's going to change over time or all of a sudden at the same time as you're doing that, we're going to be buying a company or we're going to be switching systems or we're going to be switch, you know, are you adaptable enough and are, and are you comfortable enough with change to, to kind of manage through that? So, you know, I'm looking for people that have, you know, tell me about changes you've been through, not only professionally, but personally as well. Um, you know, that, that you can talk about uh, opportunities that you took advantage of that, that helped you grow as a person. Um, I, I think the, the biggest thing, and, and I tell this to my team all the time, we got to have a sense of adventure. Uh, it's just, you know, li life's going to take you down a lot of different paths, personally and professionally. Got to have a little bit of a sense of adventure. And everyone's going to have a different comfort level with that. But to me, that's that's critically important to, you know, as I think about my 16 years here at Scripps and the amount of change we've been through, if you don't have a sense of adventure and kind of a courageous spirit, uh, you're not going to be long for the job. Well, that, that's such a great point because, you know, obviously the rate of change is only accelerating and there's no reason to believe it's going to slow down or stop. So, so that ability to embrace it, because, you know, what a psychologist would say is, you know, change is threatening, right? Mm -hmm. And we respond negatively to change because somewhere deep in our reptilian brain is, you know, it's life threatening. So change is bad. Um, but the way you phrase it, which I love, which is, no, it's an adventure. Like, how do you go and embrace what could happen? And is there going to be the chance for failure or some kind of, I'm making air quotes, harm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. sure. Like, there's no guarantees. Right. But, you know, if everything is a problem, a threat, like, it, that, that is really going to weigh you down. And you're not going to be very adaptable. Why right. would you be? Right. Well, I don't want things to change. You, you know, a, another side of that, too, and this comes to us as leaders, right? We have to make sure people understand that they have the appropriate backstops, too, right? Meaning we're, what? Meaning we're not just going to ask you to take an opportunity and say, well, if you fail, you're fired. Like, why would I do that then? Right. So, I, like, that's one thing in, in my career. Um, all the way back, I've always felt like there were people that said, hey, we want you to take this, but we're going to take the time with you to train you. We're going to take the time with you. So so you, you know, learn a different skill set and you learn how to do this the correct way. Um, you know, I, I could go over so many examples of that in my career, but I never felt like my failure would cost me my job. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as I was doing things, doing things, what I was being asked to do or trying my hardest, I never felt like that. I felt like, you know, people would, would have my back and, and, and they have. And so I think as leaders, you know, it's one thing to encourage people to be adaptable and take advantage of opportunities and have a sense of adventure. But it, you're not just pushing them out like, hey, have fun. You know, don't come talk to me. No, let me help you through this change. Let me help you, you know, through this learning, this new skill set or learning how to deal with a, a, a situation differently than what you've had to do in the past. So I think, you know, we have we have a, a, a responsibility there as well, not only to give those opportunities, but also to make sure that it's still, you know, that they still feel, you know, intellectually safe uh, taking them. And, and yeah. you know, I, I think that's super critical. Well, it, it is. And then. Super quick anecdote, but but we recently had a client that was very successful in their their main role. They got tapped by the CEO to go lead a new initiative, mm -hmm. which was out of their comfort zone. But they saw the adventure in it and wanted to you know do what was helpful to the company. So they said, "Sure, I'll, I'll give that a go." And not too many months into it, the board's like, "Yeah, we're we're making a change in strategic direction. That's not something that we really want to pursue anymore." And rather than find a home for this known great performer, mm -hmm. it's like, well, that initiative's over, so you're over. Goodbye. Yeah. I mean, my jaw's still on the ground. I'm like, do you right. know what you guys just let go of? Right. Like, you would fight tooth and nail to go get somebody like that. And yet, Think about you know, the message that you send to the people that are still there, too. A hundred percent. And I was just like, wow, that, that was like one of the most short-term things. So when you talk about, like, letting people know you've got their back, you know, and I'll, I'll equip you for success and and we will show appreciation for you being willing to go out on the limb Absolutely. in our name 
for yes. our behalf, right? Like, and, and not everything works and that's okay. Mm -hmm. We learned. And so that's something that we're not gonna do any more of, but you're still a highly valued employee. How can we deploy your great strengths mm -hmm. in an area that we are focused on now? So um, last, last question. Um, what advice would you give 28 year old Kevin with the benefit of hindsight? Well, uh, so uh, this this is something, and and you know, I'm I'm glad that I've practiced this, but I would reiterate it um, uh, even more: is that you you are going to come in contact with a lot of amazing people, you know, through, on your journey, whether they're your direct supervisor, manager, um, whether they're coworkers, whether they're people that you meet through. I I, I mean, some of the best people I know are the consultants that I've worked with. Yeah. Um, in the past that, that I've learned so much from. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that I always committed to doing was I'm going to try to remember one thing, at least one thing from every person that I really, you know, come in contact with. And one of my favorite stories there, and you can see the my red pen here, when I was 19, I guess, 19, maybe 20, um, and I was working uh, in, in the retirement plans group, one of the things that came with that job was I had to write letters to the retirement, you know, retirees. And, you know, you take business writing, you know, in school and, but what does that really translate to in the real world? And I had obviously no idea. So as I was right, as I would write these, the, the uh, lady Marge who ran the retirement plans group would take her red pen out and she would mark up the letters and she'd hand it back to me. And, you know, this was before the day of red line and word. Um, and, and so she'd hand it back to me and I would retype it. But she would tell me why. Like, this is why you want to say it this way. It's not that maybe in some cases that you were wrong, but you want to say it this way in this type of communication. And so when she retired, I asked her if I could have a red pen. And I still have the, I have a red pen. So this is from 1997. Um, and, and I still have the red pen. And it's just kind of my constant reminder for things that I've learned from people in the past. You know, I had another situation where, you know, I told you as a, as a younger, you know, person, I, I valued competence above everything mm -hmm. um, until I realized how important people relationships were. Yes. And being right was secondary to, to people relationships in a lot of cases. And had a, had a manager that um, showed just an, unbelievable amount of kindness to me as my wife and I were, were going through a personal situation um, where she lost her mom. She was eight months pregnant with our youngest and she lost her mom. Um, and uh, it was a an incredibly tough time uh, for our family. And I, and I had a, a leader in, in, in my group at the time that just showed a, a just an incredible amount of kindness. And it was like, wow, that's what it feels like when you're re when you treat people really good. Yes. And from then on, it's like, no, I, I, I want to be like that. I want to, I want people to remember that. I couldn't tell you whether I thought he was super smart or I, but I remember how he made me feel and how valuable he, he made me feel in that situation. So like, what can you take away from those people? Um, because trust me, um, you know, I, th I think uh, somebody said, you know, you're the, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I, I think there's some truth to that, right? You, you, you are going to 20 years later in your career, you're going to find that you're kind of uh, bits and pieces of people that you've allowed to influence you um, over your career. And, and um, you know, so, so don't be afraid to take those positive things, even if it's an actual physical memento. of that. <laughs> Kevin, this is awesome. I know that your team and the people that you are influencing, you're going to be one of those five people for a lot of folks who will be better for it. And it's very cool to see you pass along the legacy that, that you've inherited uh, as you've been through your career. But everything that you've shared today around change management, you know, the, the importance of building relationships, uh, the role that data plays in making better decisions. Um, and, and then you know, just th this last bit on, on empathy and caring and all those kinds of things that at the end of the day, we're people, we're not work producing units. And your team knows when you value them as a person first in a work producing unit second. So uh, this has been phenomenal. I'm so glad that you took a few minutes out of your busy day to share so much great insight with us. So thank you. Bob, thanks for having me. It was great speaking with you. Awesome. And everybody who's been listening or watching on YouTube, thank you so much. Uh, and again, uh, if there's anything that we can be do, do to be of help to you with any transition employees or personal career coaching, please check us out at career.club. Again, Kevin, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for listening. Bye-bye. Take care. I know you.